So, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our grammar. Uh, my name is Katrina, and I'm from the British Science Association, who helped organise uh, this talk with Dr. Becky Stewart today. Uh, Becky was awarded the Daphne Orr Award Lecture for Digital Innovation at the British Science Festival uh, in September this year. Uh, she's one of a series of seven awards given to promising early career researchers who are particularly skilled at communicating their research. Uh, the British Science Association would also like to thank 3M for having to support our award lectures to one round other festivals. Um, so now it is really time to introduce Becky. So Becky is a lecturer in the School of Electronic Engineering and Computer Science at Queen Mary University in London. Her research is based in the Centre for Digital Music, which is where she also did her PhD. Her research interests centre around wearable technologies that can enhance artistic performances, be it dance, theatre or music. Uh, she's also worked as an engineer, collaborating with artists on interactive projects and installations, including a pair of shoes that help to guide you home, inspired by most of us, and turning suspension bridges into musical instruments. Uh, Becky's recently returned to academia after spending uh, four years running her own businesses. She also co-founded CoDesign, which was an arts technology education company that taught how to code or build electronics for creative projects through workshops hosted at national galleries and museums. Becky grew up in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and she lived in the UK for 11 years. Uh, and she recently, my favourite thing on Becky, bought a tandem bicycle and in her spare time uses it to get away from London and explore the countryside with her partner. So I hope you'll all join me in welcoming Becky. I'm going to tentatively talk, oh, I'm going to wait for Alex to run to the board. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There we go. So hi, thank you everyone for coming out. So great to see you all on a, on a Saturday afternoon. So we are going to be exploring the idea of e-textiles, electronic textiles. And the story starts with this woman. So does anyone know who this is? Ada Lovelace, exactly. Does anyone know what she's famous for? Technology. Yeah, she's considered one of the first computer programmers which is incredibly impressive because she was one of the first computer programmers of a computer that was never built. She programmed a machine that she never physically had in front of her. It was really just pushing forward. She came up with the idea of what is a program at all. And she was working, or the, pro the machine she was building programs for was called the analytical engine, which is an invention by this man. So this is Charles Babbage. So Charles Babbage was an inventor. And he wanted to make something that wasn't just a calculator, but he had an idea for a machine that could do something more than just calculations, that you could give it instructions and it could be more flexible in its computations beyond what your kind of normal calculator could do for kind of accounting tasks and things like that. And so he uh, gave a talk in France, and someone wrote up the notes of his lecture in French, uh, and it was a published article describing this analytical engine, because he was pitching it, trying to get money to, from people so he could actually build the thing. He was never successful. The thing was never built in his lifetime, never built in Ada's lifetime, and, uh, but there is now a small portion of it that is built, and it's inside the Science Museum uh, in London that you can go and visit and see. But so he had this article written up uh, nicely about his notes, about what his machine was for and what he was going to do with it. And he asked Ada if she could uh, help translate those notes, that article, into English uh, so that it could then be disseminated to a broader audience to try to get money from the English-speaking market to perhaps be able to fund his machine to be built. And so she translated them, but then she started adding her own notes and added actually a longer body of text than the original notes in the first place, adding in there how you could use this machine to calculate out sequences of numbers and how you would go about doing that. And that is what we consider now the first computer program, is this first idea of how you would take this mathematical expression and get it to be calculated out by this computer. Now when we say that we're programming something, so if I said, okay, we're going to learn how to program today, or you already know how to program, so go ahead and program something for me, code it, we would say, okay, it means you're going to sit in front of a computer, right? You're going to type on a keyboard, you're going to see things, words appear on the screen, and that's going to be how you write your code. But what would it mean in the 1850s 
when Charles and Ada were talking about programming a computer. What would that even be? Obviously, they're not sitting in front of a keyboard. They didn't go to the Apple store and buy a Mac and sit down and start computing on it, right? They didn't start coding on it. What does that mean to actually program a computer in the 1850s? It means working with items like this. So Charles, in his design, he was borrowing from a technology that already existed, which was punch cards or punch cards. So items like this. So this would hold the three different kinds of information. It'd be the numbers that you want to do some kind of calculation with, and instruction about what are you going to do with those numbers. You're going to add them together, you're going to multiply them. And then a third category that would be about how you move those numbers around in memory. So if you're loading in a number that you're going to want to work with, you need to store it and save it to be used later. And so all of that is information stored inside getting unwieldy with the microphone, that is information that's stored inside these series of holes or not holes. So we can see there's one spot on our card where we see there's an absence of a hole. So all of the information is represented by a series of if there's a hole there or if there's not a hole there. So we can see rows and columns of holes and then for this particular top card, just one where we don't. And this is where we represent all of this information whether it's an instruction or whether it's a, uh, a number that's being stored. So this wasn't something Charles came up with. This was borrowed technology. He had already seen that had been invented and was being used in the Industrial Revolution already. And he was merely applying it to this new idea of his analytical engine. So where did this come from? It came from the weaving industry. So this was actually something being used inside of looms. And I was, this, I'm really excited, I was in Manchester for the past couple days, and this is actually a photo I got to take yesterday from the Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester of a jacquard loom. So jacquard looms were looms that used these punch cards. So that's what all of these kind of orange things are to the side. Those are all of those cards, but being used in a loom to uh, kind of to store the information of what the pattern would be of the weave of the cloth that is being woven uh, from that very loom. And so these cards are creating a pattern. They're not doing yet computation. This isn't the same as a computer. So Charles's idea was using this mechanism to make a computer. The computer was still new. A loom is not the same as a computer. These didn't hold instructions. These only held uh, the information about the pattern being made. But it was still a very, very important connection to modern computing. So the man who came up with the system is the span, so Joseph, Joseph Marie Jacquard. So Mr. Jacquard was an inventor, and he came up with this mechanism that got named after him of making the Jacquard loom for making this ability to make really intricate patterns, in particular, really useful in silk, to make kind of beautiful different designs inside of silk in a really uh, intricate, in particular, non, doesn't have to be kind of repeating way. And this was a bit of marketing that he put out. So this is not a picture of a painting. This is a picture of woven cloth from one of his machines. So this was his advertisement, where if you put in an order on demand, he would create for you a, this image of himself, this portrait of himself that then you could put onto your wall and have as a proof of how amazing his new technology would be. So it was a piece of marketing. And we know that Charles was very much aware of this technology that Jacquard had come up with because Charles himself had one of these. So we know that there was this connection already, that it wasn't just kind of born in parallel, this idea of using these punch cards for computers, but that it did come from weaving. There was this strong connection. Charles knew about the work of Jacquard. So this machine, or this, uh, this picture in particular, took 24,000 of those cards put together. That's what I saw yesterday at the, at the museum as well. So up until, the uh, mid-1900s, so this was a machine from the 1930s, all of those cards were actually hand-sewn together. There's a specialist cardboard that was imported from France to make it, had to be strong enough to be able to go through these mechanical systems and not fall apart. And it would take, uh, artisans would actually still have to sit and hand-construct 
punch all of the holes, and then hand sew all of that, that whole chain of cards back together in order to feed it into the machine. And this is actually, this is a card lacing machine from the, from the museum in Manchester as well. And the, the date on this is 1930, so it wasn't until for you know, well over a century past these machines being used that finally it was kind of being moved past the ability of having to hand construct these, uh, all of these instructions that got fed into the looms. That's a card lacing machine. So this idea of the punch cards still moved forward past the analytical engine. So analytical engine never existed, certainly not in any time uh, when Babbage was alive. Again, I think it was 1991 was when the Science Museum built a small portion of the analytical engine. And the analytical engine, frankly, probably wasn't going to completely work, according, not according to spec, not according to the ideas that were drawn out on paper. And part of it is because the complexity of making the full computer kind of needed some other technologies to come along as well. I found a really nice analogy when I was researching, uh, and it was Da Vinci's flying machines were brilliant in their ideas, but they needed to wait for things like the gasoline engine to come along before we could start putting those into practice. Other supporting technologies were needed before aircraft were going to happen, even though Da Vinci had these amazing ideas way before his time. And it's similar with Babbage's analytical engine. We, didn't, we really needed electronic circuits. We needed uh, electronics to make things smaller, more compact, and not just have mechanical systems. So before we had electronics, the way looms worked, the way mechanical computers would have worked, are completely shafts and gears, and you can kind of think of a very steampunk aesthetic if you'd like, but very much the kinds of things you see in a museum of science and industry. A lot of camshafts, rotating gears, things like this. And it makes a very, very large machine and very complicated machine. And we needed to be able to put it down into something a little bit more sophisticated before it was really kind of going to work in practice. But it did. Eventually, we got to electronics. We were able to start making electronic computers. And when we did, when that technology kind of caught up with this idea, we still were using these punch cards. So this is a punch card from a machine by, uh, uh, from the Hollerith, uh, Henry Hollerith, and his computer. So this machine was designed for the US Census. So America was growing at such a large pace that it was taking longer than it was taking, it was taking longer to actually process all the data from the census than it was by the time you had to take the census again. It was taking years and years and years to go through all the numbers of, how, of counting all the people in the country before it was, oh, it's time to count everyone again, even though we haven't finished counting everyone last time. And so computers were being employed to try to help deal with all of this data. And Henry Hollerith made a machine in order to help deal with this. And it was so successful uh, that he continued on this idea and, turned it into a, and decided to turn it into a business beyond just using it for the census. And so we can see this is one of the examples of one of the ways you, uh, the mechanism to punch the cards to enter the information. So this one, a little bit more useful than the punch cards we saw earlier, where we have labels and it kind of tells us what all the different holes uh, represent, and a little tool to go through and mark all of the information on that card. And so this machine uh, was successful, turned into a company that had your mergers and your acquisitions. The original name was, the, the long one, was the Computing Tabulating Recording Company. And then a couple decades later is now what we know as IBM. So this was very much the history of weaving, feeding into punch cards, feeding into computers, kind of old versions of computers, into the computers that we deal with today. If you have an, any IBM product or deal with it in any way, it's uh, directly linked to the punch cards of the Jacquard loom. So why were punch cards amazing in the first place? Why were they innovative for looms? So we can kind of say punch cards were great, but kind of what does that, why was it something new? Why was that a, a great invention around the, in the Industrial Revolution? So we need to talk about how we make cloth, kind of take a step back. How do we actually take a thread and turn it into a fabric? Take a thread and actually turn it into clothing that we can wear on our bodies. Well, there's two main ways that we can create a cloth. And if you're wearing a t-shirt and jeans today, then you're wearing both ways. So the first way is 
uh, knitting. So knitting is where you take one single long thread and you loop it on itself. So like my cardigan and my uh, shirt underneath, these are both knit materials. It has a nice stretch, it has this loop structure, and when you look at it up close, you kind of have these rows of Vs going together. Second way that uh, gets used, so this is the, uh, this is an older way of making cloth. So this is uh, millennia old, while knitting is more around centuries old of a way to make cloth. And this is weaving. So how weaving works is you have a series of threads in one direction, and then perpendicular to those threads, you have other ones going across. So our long threads are what we call the warp. So if you go to a, a fabric store or a fabric stall in the market, and you want to buy some fabric, it will be wound up on a bolt or some kind of uh, 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 round thing uh, that, you're, that the fabric will be kind of going around. So those warp threads are the threads that wrap around that bolt of fabric. And the weft is then the threads that go the other direction, the shorter threads, they go up and down the, with, the, with the bolt of fabric. And so the, when we have what's called a plain weave here, this means we just have our weft, which is going across our screen, that's just going over and under every other warp thread inside of our fabric. And uh, so that's what our, our looms are setting up. So this is called plain weave, when it's over and under every other. But you can start playing with patterns then. So if you don't go over, every, over and under every single one and then alternate for the next row, you can start making other kinds of patterns. And if you go over and under in a certain pattern where you start seeing these kind of diagonal stripes instead, that's what you call a twill. And there's a whole bunch of different types of fabrics that have this twill pattern. But if you have twill that's made out of a certain thread and dyed a certain blue with indigo, then that's what we call denim. And so our jeans are things that we are, have woven fabric in them from a loom, while our t-shirts and cardigans and jumpers, those are knit fabrics coming from a knit structure instead. And so that's our two main ways of making uh, uh, materials. So when we're making, if we focus more on making the uh, woven fabric, if we take a look at how a machine actually makes that, so we can kind of think about how we can lay out those threads on a table and by hand go through and gently put a, a thread over and under, but we could have a lot of tools in order to make this a lot easier on ourselves. And so if we're looking at a loom, so if we start by looking at this photo here. So when it goes, so these are the warp threads that are already stretched along the loom. So these are the long ones that make a really long like meters and meters and meters of fabric that we get wrapped around our bolt of fabric that we'd see at the fabric store. So every single one of those threads are going to be going through kind of like a hanging needle, kind of like the eye of a needle, so that each one can be controlled and pulled up so that it's really easy for that weft thread to go under or can be left, this is gonna be jumping around, or it can be left down so that warp thread can go over it. And so it's a way of controlling it. So typically, when we have a shaft loom, we have those, all of those different kinds of strings that are holding onto these pieces of metal that are kind of like giant needles that just have a thread passing through the, through the hole, through the eye, and each one of those are called a heddle. They get attached to a single bar, so you could kind of move one, a whole group of them up at a time, or leave a whole group of them down at a time and control them in this different way. We have here a, just in case it was a little bit more illustrative, this is a, a loom that doesn't have any of the, it's not warped up yet. It doesn't have those threads going across. And instead we just see hanging down where all those threads would get connected instead. So you kind of can see the absence of the warp on the loom and where it would get put through, uh, or where the, all of those, each, every single individual thread gets controlled been moved up or down. And so before the jacquard loom, you had to have a pattern. So you had only so many kind of groups of threads. So for example, this is a pattern you could make if you had eight shafts, so eight groupings of threads. This was the type of pattern that could be made. If you then upped that to have kind of 32 beams, so 32 groups 
of threads that could get moved up or left down, then you can get a lot more intricate of a pattern, right? Because if you could only, if you can control uh, kind of smaller groupings of what goes up and down, then you can start making more and more intricate patterns. So what the Jakar loom did was it turned a loom into the ability to move individual threads. So now a single thread could be left up or down. It doesn't have to be one thirty second of all of the threads or some subsection of all the threads, but we could control. It was like having a single shaft, a single beam controlling each individual thread, which let us have a lot more control over the pattern that was being woven. So this is a jacquard loom that's at the, at the Manchester Museum of uh, Science and Industry. So it's hard to get the scale on this, but you can see how you have a ladder to go up the side of it. It's massive, a massive machine. So this is the same one where the very top there, you can see just slightly the orange on the back side of the, the wooden beams. Those are our, our punch cards that hold the patterns. So those punch cards are just stopping. If there's a hole, it means the, the, the single mechanism that's controlling if that thread gets pulled up or down, it makes it so it stops. If there's a hole, it means that that thread can get pulled up. So that's how we're representing in those punch cards information about the pattern, whether at that point in time when that left thread goes across, is it going to go under or, or, under or over or under each of those individual warp threads? And that will create our pattern. So we can see this is kind of the very bottom of down here of what's being woven here. We have kind of actually three independent pieces of cloth being woven on this. But it's a very intricate pattern. You might not be able to quite make it out, but it's actually it's like a, a photograph of a factory building. I think it might be a, a photograph of the, the building that the museum itself is housed inside. Uh, making, so we're not making just a plain weave. We're not making a checkerboard pattern. We're not just making a plain uh, denim kind of pattern. We have a really intricate photo. So photo quality image woven into cloth automatically by a machine. So we always could have a person do that. An artisan could always create that kind of cloth, but Jacquard made it so we can now do this in factories. We could do this at scale, and that was the big, big uh, push forward. And it was this ability to take these patterns, and there's a lot of work to put these patterns into punch cards. That was several days of work for someone to do, multiple people to sit and make the punch cards and then lace them together. So remember Jacquard's picture, that was 24,000 punch cards that are all created by hand, put together by hand. But once you have that information, you can then just keep repeating it. Making that cloth could happen really, really easily, really automatically. All of this machinery is, this is a power loom. It's powered. It can go on its own. And so the system feels, uh, uh, feeds directly into the same kinds of concepts that create computers these days as well. So everything about weaving is a binary choice. Is that thread going above or under? Everything two, is two choices. Are you going to see that warp thread or are you going to see the wedge thread? There's no other option. You have to see thread has to go on top or thread has to go underneath. No other option there. And so we can mathematically represent this as a one or zero, which we see a lot, especially in films when we're talking about computer code in the matrix. We see ones and zeros going by. And on the basics, basis of how we create computers is on this idea of binary choices, where you have a decision to be made. The decision can be labeled a zero, can be labeled a one. We could say, if we're going to see a, a warp thread, it's going to be a zero. If we're going to see a weft thread, it's going to be a one. We've just labeled those two things. And now we can start using math in order to predict what's going to happen and start working with it. And we're starting to move into computer science and what computer science is. So when we actually want to, let's step back into the weaving world and a little bit away from the computer world for another second. When we want to make a fabric, we need to make some more decisions besides just are we knitting it or are we weaving it? But what are, we, what are we knitting? What are we weaving? We have to work with materials. And so we have kind of three main categories of materials that we work with. So the first one is working with plants. So fabrics or threads, textiles that come from some kind of plant-based material. It grows out of the ground, and we manipulate it in some way. And of course, uh, Cottonopolis and the Industrial Revolution was fed off of cotton, and cotton being used as the 
really cheap uh, material that was also revolutionary in its material properties in that it was really light and breathable. We like having cotton t-shirts. We like it in really warm weather uh, clothing. It's a very breathable fabric. We like the properties of it. Well, we also, uh, and uh, the UK in particular, is very familiar with working with wool, which is also why the textile industry was a, this was a great place for the textile industry to kind of grow up around cotton, was because already working with fibers that came from animals were something that everyone was really experienced with. But of course, that came mostly from sheep. This sheep in particular, this is a merino uh, sheep, and so merino wool has some amazing natural abilities. So it's antimicrobial. It, can, it, it kind of fights against the bacteria that would make you kind of smell sweaty. Uh, and it has amazing kind of technical abilities. And so up until the mid 20th century, athletic wear was being made out of, out of merino wool because it had this ability to wick away and regulate uh, sweat and heat from the body, and it was really useful for athletics. Of course, we've moved on past wearing wool jerseys. You don't go off and watch your favorite football team wearing wool anymore. We have a, kind of a new third category of materials that we work with, and that's synthetics. So this synthetics largely come from petrochemicals, so dead dinosaurs that we've dug up out of the ground and processed a bunch. Uh, but we get things like, like nylon and acrylics. And now uh, we also have some really exciting materials like Kevlar. Has anyone heard of Kevlar? So Kevlar gets used in kind of anti-stab and bulletproof uh, uh, garments. So Kevlar is five times stronger at the same weight than steel. So Kevlar is super, super strong, but super, super light. And we can turn it into fibers and mix it into fabric. So these are Kevlar gloves. So these are gloves that can, are useful for like a butcher to wear. So as they're cutting up some meat, they're not cutting into their hands, or their hands are, are more protected than they would be otherwise. And Kevlar gets used a lot inside of like American football uh, protection on the kind of shoulder pads and things, and then also inside of police and mil military uniforms as well. So it's a really amazing man-made material that has these new properties that we don't find naturally in nature. We've kind of, we've engineered these new, these new materials. And there's now even another category of materials that we're working with, and it's one that you've probably come across in unexpected places. So these are smart materials that get called, this kind of broad category of materials that have these kind of an extra dimension of some kind of interest to them. So this is a thermochromic pigment. So that sounds really fancy, but you could probably go into a tourist shop and if you've ever found like a mug that changes color just by pouring your tea or coffee into it, then you're working with a thermochromic pigment. So that's something that changes color according to heat. So if you heat it up, the black paint here, it, the black paint will go transparent and show the image underneath. And then that whole effect is reversible. When the temperature comes back down again, it will go back to being opaque, and we'll see the black image instead of the, uh, the painted image underneath that. And so this is just one type of what we call smart material. I work with a different type of smart material, which is called e-textiles. So e-textiles stand for electronic textiles, and these are cloths and threads that are conductive, so they conduct electricity, and you can start making circuits and build electronics out of threads and cloths. So for example, this is a, a nylon thread that's been microplated with silver, I believe, around it. And so you have kind of a core of nylon and then a really, really thin layer of uh, thread or metal around those individual pieces of thread. And then the whole thread gets plied together like, and, and treated like you would when you make any other kind of, of thread or yarn. One of my favorite versions, uh, there's lots of different conductive threads. And one that I really like has that core. The core itself is Kevlar. And then the metal is like a long, kind of really flat ribbon of metal that's been made really long and thin, and it's wrapped around that Kevlar core. And what's really neat about that is because it's Kevlar, it, it melts at a really, really high temperature. So that means you can solder to it, 
and not have the thread uh, kind of melt underneath. So you can't solder to this thread because the nylon melts underneath the heat of the soldering iron. But you can, with the Kevlar threads, you can still solder to it. So you can start mixing in kind of traditional electronics with sewing techniques and get between the thread and, the, uh, and uh, a soldered uh, circuit board. But what's interesting is actually this idea of making threads with metals like this isn't particularly new in the slightest. And even this approach of taking really long, thin pieces of metal and wrapping it around another, another th uh, kind of non-conductive or cheaper thread is something that's been found in ancient times. So these are items found, I believe, in Egypt, either Egypt or Greece. Um, it's been found in both places. And this was used not to conduct electricity. They weren't wearing light up LED garments in ancient Greece, but it was to decorate. It was decorative embroidery. So kind of gold and, and precious metals were being used on decorative garments to say, look how rich I am. I can take this thread that's really hard to make and then also pay someone to stitch it onto my garment and wear gold on me. But it being metal, it has the conductive properties that we are excited about today. And what's interesting, even with all of our technology and all of our abilities to kind of make new things, we're still using the same kind of approach in some places where we're just taking a really long ribbon of metal and wrapping it around a conductive or a non-conductive core. So I have some examples. So enough kind of just talking about these things in theory, but have some examples of, so you can see this in effect. What does it mean to have a thread or a fabric that conduct electricity? What, what, what can you do with that? So before I show you some examples, I want to first talk about this lady. So this is Daphne Oram. And so as you heard in the beginning, this was in a, a lecture, an award, uh, and research I put together for the Daphne Oram uh, award lecture, and Daphne Orm was a founder of the BBC Radiophonic Workshop, and she was uh, absolutely a brilliant pioneer in pushing forward how computers could generate music, and this idea that a computer was more than something that could just calculate out numbers and do kind of dry tasks, like taking census data and helping us organize our finances, but something that could be used as a creative tool. And it's not and it's even something that Ada Lovelace herself envisioned. So this is very Victorian prose. Uh, but what she's saying is, well, if we understand a little bit more about what is the science behind how we make music, and we start making these new tools like computers, well, that means we could start using these new tools to actually make music themselves. And so even Ada, with her, her genius of looking into how a computer program could exist before she even had a computer in front of her to program. She also was thinking all the way to, well, if we have a computer program running on a computer that doesn't exist, we could eventually write a computer program that can create music and play music on that computer that doesn't even yet exist. So I have, always dangerous with live demos, we'll see how this goes. So I have some fabrics up here, and in particular, oh, excellent. Let's see if we can get that up more. Nope, that's where it's going to live. Okay. So I have, you can't rearrange things so you can see it a little bit more. So I have here two pieces of, it's really quite pink fabric, comes out kind of washed out on the screen. And what this fabric is, is a mixture Actually, we can bring up a slide of it so you can see it a little bit more. So this is a close-up of this fabric. So it's just what we've seen. It's a plain weave. So there's nothing special about the weave structure. It's over, under, over, under. But the material itself is a mixture of bamboo and silver. So the bamboo is actually what's dyed pink, and you can see it that it's a bit pink when you're up close. And then you have the gray silver strands that are mixed into it as well. So it's that silver that makes it conductive. So we have, come back to here. So I have two pieces of fabric that are conductive. It's feeding into this board here that's going to detect now when electricity is allowed to flow in between from this piece of fabric to this piece of fabric. And 
when that connection's put together, we could even hear some of Daphne Oram's music. So this is some of the music that she made out of uh, her work with computers. And so that stops when I don't have the fabrics touch anymore. When I have the fabrics touch, it knows what it's touching, knows when it's not. Knows when it's touching, knows when it's not. So we already have something a little bit special going on. We have fabrics that can kind of be smart. They can know when they're coming in contact with each other. Now that might seem like it's a little bit limited in use, but I once challenged uh, some students of mine to take just switches, just, just on off, and we were, being, uh, we were uh, just uh, prototyping with aluminum foil, and if they could just put together switches on the body, what could they detect? And so they put together a series of switches that could detect if you were doing the Macarena. And so don't tell me you can't do useful things with just these kinds of switches placed around the body. So if we are going to switch to a different board now, I'm going to show you this fabric up close. So this fabric is a white cotton. Oh, actually, no. We're going to, sorry, before we go to this fabric, one more thing with this fabric, with the pink fabric. So we're going to work with that same fabric. So going back still to this fabric, we're going to use its conductive properties, but we're now connecting it to a slightly different circuit. So now it's going to do something a little bit different for us. Wait for it to start up. Okay, so now we have it connected to a slightly different board. And, what, number two? Three. And so this is now using a slightly different circuit. So this is using something called proximity sensing. So as my hand gets closer, oh, it's calibrated weird. Let's see if we can get it to behave. Try that again. So, as my hand gets closer, there we go. So, as my hand gets closer, it knows. So, I'm not touching it yet. It's just knowing if I'm getting closer or not. And then, if I touch it all the way, we hear some more of Daphne Oram's work. So, only when I touch it, it plays the audio. When I don't touch it, it stops. But it also knows when I'm just nearby. It knows something is close, but not quite touching. It even knows when I'm touching harder as well. So if we now go to the other fabric, bring up a picture of this fabric. We're going to use the same circuitry, so the same effect. So we have a piece of fabric that's conductive. And because we have this conductive piece of fabric, it can tell if I'm coming near it. So this is because of something called capacitance. And so I'm a, a charged body. I'm something that can hold electrical charge. All of you are things that can hold electrical charge. And my holding of electrical charge can kind of interrupt the circuit. It can be detected. My presence can be detected by how close I get to that piece of fabric, and in particular, to the metal that's inside that fabric. So this fabric is plain white cotton, and then it has silver threads that are put along in kind of a grid. So when you buy this fabric, it comes in a grid, and what I've done is I've unpicked the threads that used to be here. So instead, we have electrically isolated pieces of thread. So we have a piece of thread going along that way, and then that way, then that way, and each of those act like a single just piece of fabric, essentially. So they don't touch each other electrically, they're completely isolated, and it's like I have now, each one of those rows is its own sensor that can detect how close I am. So now, can we see my hand? Yeah. So, I can start to say where on this piece of fabric I'm actually touching the thread. And I can move my finger back and forth can know if I'm touching a lot or a little, where it is, multi-touch. So I have two. So one's a little bit harder than the other. That one's harder. That one's harder. 
if this was set up to a piano, I could play chopsticks for you. And then, even more, I can take, this is just normal cotton fabric. There's nothing special at all about this. No conductive properties at all. But I can put that over this. I don't have to actually come in contact. So I don't even see those conductive traces underneath, and I can still have the same effect happen. I can still have the fabric know where I'm touching uh, uh, along that piece of fabric, each one of those individual sensors. So that's just some kind of beginning stages of what you could do when you start incorporating and using weaving processes in particular to start putting conductive materials into a fabric. So what do I do with these kinds of things? So I've, uh, I've worked with uh, different museums and galleries to teach people how to make their own circuitry using these conductive materials. So this was a, so this was a toy we called Tossel, and he has an LED in his tongue, and he has conductive thread in, a, in, in his hair up top. And if you just mess up his hair, you tossle his hair, the conductive threads will touch each other and close that switch and turn on the LED. And then we have uh, some stitches here in order to make a really simple battery and LED circuit. So some really simple circuitry. But then up top, we have the ability to plug your phone into one end of this sewn circuit. So each of these different patches have a different electrical function and they're just clipped together. Um, but it, this was my first prototype and it, you make a full scarf. And then you plug your headphones in the other end and then you can play with a, a little button uh, in the, the middle there, you can kind of see a pink button, and where you put the button on the scarf, it will move, the, pan the music from one side, from one ear, to the other, to the center. So a really simple little audio mixer, a passive audio mixer and panner by uh, stitching out the circuitry. Now you can of course get a lot more advanced with these things as well. So this is a performance of a piece called Hacking the Body, in which each of the dancers it's an improvisational dance piece, and each of the dancers are, they only move when they have this little motor that has a ribbon right on their neck, that we call the tickle motor. When that tickle motor goes, they respond to it, and they, they dance, and that's how they start forming together the improvisational piece. So that motor goes when the other dancer, they have a sensor using the exact same technology here, they have a sensor, when that sensor gets triggered, it's what's inside the pink on the shoulder, then their partner will get the motor to tell them to start moving, to start dancing. And also will cause some audio chimes to play. And all of that was made using circuitry. So this is the circuitry that's inside there. Uh, and then as a program note, so the choreographer who I worked with on this piece will be performing uh, some other uh, improv uh, kind of technology improv improvised uh, dance performance next weekend next Saturday, as, as make sure I get the, the date right there from Alex. Uh, so Kate Suchio will be, uh, will be here doing a performance for kind of seeing work going on past this as well. So if you have these, so stepping back to this capacitive sensing, so the sensing that we used in that piece to tell the dancers when to start dancing and they could wirelessly communicate to each other, having the same kind of technology that I have up here inside the cloth, well, this technology, uh, if you have these parallel lines, I could say where I'm going across on the cloth where my finger is. Well, we could think, well, if we kind of even th think to weaving, where we have lines going this way, threads going this way, we could figure out then where entirely in an X and Y kind of position where, uh, where your finger is and locate things. And so that's what this project was. It was actually stitched out instead of being uh, kind of embroidered instead of being uh, woven, but it's this grid that lets you then detect when you put your hand on, so this piece of fabric sits inside the scarf, when you start putting one finger on and moving it around, you have then the computer knows where on the scarf you're communicating with it. Then you start adding, uh, you then say to the computer, okay, recognize, remember how you see the sensor data, how you see those numbers coming in when I put one, one finger on, when I touch my scarf that way. Now, remember how when I have a fist, now remember when I'm touching it with two fingers. And just kind of 
recognize how the patterns of the, of the information from the scarf form together. So using information from the, ele the electronics that are embedded inside the scarf, kind of keep track of what's going on, and then be able to tell me and recognize when I have one finger on there, when I have two fingers, and recognize the gestures now that I'm interacting with the scarf, have a gesture recognition scarf. And so that whole process is just called machine learning. It's just having a computer recognize a pattern and tell you when it sees that pattern or not. And so this was a, actually it was just a, it was a hack. It was just done in a couple days to kind of uh, feel out the, uh, the idea. Uh, so those are kind of some kind of arts-based approaches. But of course, the question you always get when you're working with technology for the arts is, yes, but like, what's something useful you could do with this? What would be something else that could be used for e-textiles? So some other work that's happening on, not that I think actually working in, in the arts and for the arts is absolutely a brilliant place to push technology forward, but e-textiles are being used in other domains as well. And so this is a, a temperature sensing yarn. So this is work out of Nottingham Trent University uh, that I visited a couple years ago. And this is a PhD student, uh, Pasindu, and he is interested in making bandages better for when you have a bandage over, an, over a cut. And if the, there's a, a little bit of a catch-22 when you have a bandage. So the bandage itself is keeping out things to keep away infection so that your body can heal itself. But if you're getting an infection, you want to catch it as early as possible. But so then if you are trying to keep checking and lifting up the bandage to see if you have an infection or if you're, you're healing just okay, well, now you're more likely to actually give yourself an infection in the first place. And so disturbing the bandage is going to perhaps make it more likely that you get sick. But one of the signs of an infection setting in is temperature spikes in the area where there is an infection. So he's been working on making threads that have sensors in them, that's what this little chip is, that detect uh, temperature. And so making, weaving, I think it's woven, uh, also could be knit, uh, making a bandage that has this smart thread in it that keeps track of the temperature so then your doctor can just over Bluetooth know is there a place where I should be concerned? Or does it seem like everything's okay and there's no reason to disturb that bandage in the first place? And so uh, part of what their technology that they're working on is how can you take electronic components, make them really, really small, so small that they fit into a normal thread. And then that thread can get put into a knitting machine or put into a loom and woven in the same ways that we already make textiles. Start incorporating more uh, advanced sensors into, uh, into this work. But, of course, this is just part of the, uh, of the computing system. It's not kind of making a whole textile computer itself. It's just the input so far is what we've really talked about. But there's a pair of artists based in Vienna who are saying, well, computing has its foundations in textiles. What if textiles and electronic textiles were the way computers were made in the first place. What if we never veered off to working with PCBs, printed circuit boards, things made out of fiberglass and, and hard, inflexible objects? What if we always built computers out of textiles themselves? What would that look like? And so their uh, art project is called Stitching Worlds, and they've been, they started with, well, how would you store data? So we now store we we've, we've know how to store data on magnetic things, so like old cassette tapes. We know how to store things in uh, CDs, optically. We know all kinds of different ways to store information. Of course, that information is at the lowest level. Is again, is that zero and that one? Is something a zero? Is something a one? That zero and one might say how to weave something. It might say how to log onto your Facebook. But it's, it's the, the, the base level of how we store information. So they've started with this is memory, this is data storage. So whether something is white or black, those are magnetized beads that are embroidered and uh, around uh, conductive threads that are inside the white circles. And so they can set, each one is magnetized, so it's a north or a south pole facing up. And so that stores whether we need to remember that this is a one or a zero, or a one or a zero. So they've started with the memory, how would you make that using textile, textile, uh, hand textile techniques? Then they said, okay, 
So now that we can store something with 0 and 1, when we're starting to build up a computer, we start working with this branch of mathematics called logic. And we start combining zeros and ones together, saying if you, you know, using things like and and or and nor and xor and all of these kinds of ways that we, we start building up computing at the basis of computer science. And so what they've built here, out of crochet, this is a nor gate. So this is the, or sorry, xor gate. So this is the, the building block of starting to build up a computer, of saying how would you start actually doing computations on these magnetized beads. And it's if this little, so each bead has a little crocheted uh, flap to it. And if it flips up or it flips down, it's representing whether that was a zero or that was a one. And combining the whole thing together in crochet starts to build up a textile computer. So of course, that's, you might say, that's really big. That's, that's just a really small part of a computer. And you need, you, there's so many of those inside your phone in your pocket right now to make that in crochet you'd have something that's the size of a room, if not bigger. Well, that's the way we started with computers as well. Computers started being the sizes of rooms, actually bigger than rooms, many rooms put together. And it was the invention of the transistor that really started to shrink down the computer into a small version that you could fit into your pocket. And so transistors that also exist in textile are being worked on in the lab as well. So this ability to take something that is, can kind of store states and put it into a textile, a thread-like format. So this is very much now in the field of material science and very much still in the lab. It's not something you're going to see on the shelf at a product in any time particularly soon, but we are working towards this and how we would actually make a full computer out of textiles. This is the building block of that. So of course, once we are start building up the textiles and have these kind of base components, we need to then think, well, how do we tell computer, or how do we start building them themselves? So we're going to have to work with textile machines. So we're going back to the loom. How would you use the loom or the knitting machine to take these textiles and start building them up into a computer? If we have transistors, if we have sensors, we have all these different components we're putting together, well, how, how do we like, fit them together into something? So this is from a, a PhD uh, work by uh, Pritiveha, who uh, at Brunel was looking into design approaches. So she's a weaver. And she was looking at how do you take a design approach to you have a circuit that you need to make. How do you get a loom to completely make it for you all in one go without having a lot of handwork involved as well without it, so that it could be an industrial process. And so this is a, a three-dimensional kind of pleated fabric that came off the loom just like this that has conductive threads and LEDs all embedded directly into the fabric. And so she been, has been looking at how do you, uh, how do you take, how as a designer, you want to make an e-textile, something that's electronic out of textiles, what are the design processes that you need to, to, to work with? Now, of course, this is starting to be scaled up now as well. So Google has been looking at how e-textiles could be used inside their own products, and they're, only, and they're even going to have a, uh, last they said, that they'll have a, a product in the spring that's going to be released with a collaboration with Levi's. So one of the problems with working with these conductive threads is when they go through these industrial processes, by the time they go through the industrial loom and actually get put in the fabric, all the metal is just scraped away. It's not conductive anymore. It's such a really, really intense process. The things that your fabrics go through before you put them on your body are really, really, they get exposed to open flame, they, all kinds of chemical, they get stretched with a lot of force. It's a really violent process to make something like a textile. And so they were interested in making threads that could handle going through industrial looms. And then on top of it, they needed to be threads that don't just come in the color of gray. Because right now, conductive textiles mostly are gray the color of silver or stainless steel. And so they, being Google, they were able to just say, oh, hey, factory, we have money. Can we pay you just to make a thread with these properties, which they've done. So these are conductive threads to the side there. And then, their demonstration is making exactly the same kind of technology that is demoing up here. They've just made a grid. So they have a grid of these threads in this fabric. And then it can detect, using this proximity sensing, where, the, uh, where a hand is. And so they're making a jacket with Levi's that on the sleeve you can um, dismiss 
and accept and respond to like phone calls and messages and alerts from your phone. The idea is when you're cycling, you can then interact with things. You can you know, have a discussion later about whether you think that's a particularly innovative or useful uh, product to be put out there with e-textiles. But it shows that they think there's interest in it, and they think in e-textiles and interacting with our fabrics as an interface is something that's going to take off in the future. So the manufacturing and the scaling up problem is being worked on. It's not entirely solved yet, but it's getting there. And so if we come back to our looms, so they've been making fabrics that can handle going through industrial looms. So this is the modern version of that Jacquard loom that we have the picture of from uh, the Manchester Museum of Science and Industry from earlier. So this is what a modern Jacquard loom looks like. So we still use this process. We're not using paper punch cards anymore. We have a computer that's storing our data. And so now we have a computer that's controlling how our weaving comes together. We have textiles that can be conductive themselves, and we have all these components coming together that in the future, and perhaps in the not too distant future, we might even have looms and uh, computerized looms that are weaving out new computers themselves for us to wear and to put into the objects around us. So that is everything for me. And so we're going to, I, if there's any burning questions, I'm very happy to, to take them now. But we also have a room just down the corridor reserved so that we can kind of uh, interact a little bit closer. And you're very welcome to come see samples and different objects like this. And so I think we'll probably just take questions there if everyone's OK with that. And then we can kind of discuss uh, and kind of get tactile. And uh, you can feel the different materials and see what they're like. Uh, so I think that's down in the, I don't know, the next room, but we'll follow, we'll go together. <laughs> Thank you.